Overnight, Zimbabwe's military seized power and detained its despotic ruler, Robert Mugabe. Major General Moyo assured the country that the 93-year-old president and his family were, quote, safe and sound. We wish to make it abundantly clear that this is not a military takeover of government. And even though the military is denying this is a coup, the citizens of Zimbabwe woke up this morning to find the capital's airport, government offices, and state-run television all under the control of the armed forces. The streets seem calm in Harare today, after a chaotic night that saw the world's oldest head of state suddenly placed under house arrest. But even if daily life appeared to be going on as normal, everyone was only talking about one thing. We will not tolerate having any other person who was not elected to run this country. For me, as a as Mabwe, we have been in trouble with this government for the past 37 years. Mugabe has been in power since 1980, after leading the fight for Zimbabwe's independence from Britain. In the long arc of his presidency, he went from championing social services early on to becoming synonymous with bloody political suppression. And now that Mugabe is 93 and his health has been faltering, the question of who will take his place has only become more pressing. He indicated whose side he was on last week when he fired his likely successor and longtime vice president, Emerson Menengagwa. And in getting rid of his VP, Mugabe was effectively throwing his support behind his wife, Grace, she and Menengagwa represent competing factions of Mugabe's ZANU-PF party. Whereas Grace is a favorite of the party's younger civilian members, Menengagwa hails from the generation that went to war for independence in the 1970s. He still has strong ties to the military. And analysts say the events of last night are really just a way of maintaining the status quo under the old guard. This is just an attempt by one general and his allies to try to reinstall the fired vice president and set that vice president up as Zimbabwe's leader. But these are men that have a long history of committing atrocities against civilians, of being involved in corrupt business dealing. This is not the future of Zimbabwe. In Myanmar today, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson met with Aung San Suu Kyi and urged an investigation into reports of, quote, widespread atrocities against the Rohingya minority. Since August, about 600,000 Rohingya Muslims have fled the Myanmar military and taken shelter in neighboring Bangladesh. Like thousands of Rohingya refugees, Mohammed Hussain is getting the first piece of official ID recognizing his ethnicity. So he can a software madhume tar biodata entry ta niche. So he is taking the fingerprints with uh, left hand first five fingers. So data matrix uh, biometrics second part picture on a hoche. Data part ekta office part ekhane rakha hoy ebong individual copy ta enrollment je eshe take diye dao. In seven makeshift processing centers, the Bangladeshi government is trying to organize about one million Rohingya who have left Myanmar. Because identity, power port, that the government side take a key horn, a should be that they are hobby, set a shidan to the neahobe. But Amraju is other identity, Nathaka Mother Kache, Tale Aginist Amra Kake Dichi, Kibawe Dichi, Aginister Kuno. Uh, but there's more to this effort than making it easier to distribute aid. Officials could eventually use the new database to streamline the process of sending the Rohingya back to Myanmar. So far, more than 500,000 refugees have received identity cards. And Bangladesh expects to finish registering all of them this month. Humayun Rashid's work has already shown just how valuable a register of people can be in the chaos of the refugee camps. Here, it's the name of the head of family, okay? okay. His, his wife, with age, elder daughter, seven years old, and then son, 16 years old. The Bangladeshi businessman turned humanitarian started an informal census months ago as a way of tracking who received the aid he was supplying himself. It also enabled him to reunite families who'd been separated when they ran from the violence at home. 
ফ্যামিলিগুলো হারা গেছিলো দুই ভাগ হয়ে গেছিলো সো যখন এটা জান বুঝতে পারলাম আমরা ফর্মের ভিতরে বা কাগজ ডকুমেন্টেশনের মাধ্যমে তখন তাদেরকে এক করে দেওয়া হয়েছে আর আর জানে বিলেতে বিলেতে আসছিলাম সিরা সিটটা আসছিলাম সেটা আনিয়ারে মানে তারা বেগুনো আরা ফোমাতে এক সময় গিয়া করে দিয়ে দিই একসাথে করে দিয়ে দিই আর তুই বি আরে তু আই দিয়ে রে মানে আর বা আমার খবর হয় আর আর তুমি বেশি গান লাগবে বেশি খুশি লাগবে দেখা হয়ে আরো খুশি The Rohingya have fought being classified in the past when ID cards were used to persecute them. The government of Myanmar, also known as Burma, introduced identification papers based on a 1982 law that essentially categorized Rohingya as illegal immigrants, denying them rights. But refugees have welcomed the new Bangladeshi IDs, which recognize the stateless people for the first time. To arar Burma sarkar arar Rohingya nai boli ho কিন্তু আর আর কোন আর আর রোহিঙ্গা হয় দাবি করি কিন্তু কেন্দ্রে আর আর তো রাজা মাঙ্গা আছে তো আর আর রোহিঙ্গা দিয়ে হল রোহিঙ্গার কাটাকল দে দিয়ে হল আর খুশি ইনিশিয়ালি দ্য বাংলাদেশ অথরিটিজ ওনলি লিস্টেড মিয়ানমার অ্যাজ দ্য ন্যাশনালিটি অন দ্য আইডি কার্ডস বাট আফটার হিয়ারিং কমপ্লেইন্টস ফ্রম রেফিউজিস দে অ্যাডেড অ্যানাদার ওয়ার্ড রোহিঙ্গা This isn't exactly what you'd think exile looks like. But there's nothing run of the mill about fugitive billionaire Gua Wen Gue. The real estate tycoon who goes by the English name Miles has spent the last 2 years holed up 18 stories above New York Central Park, drinking his coffee out of crystal glassware. and live streaming incendiary accusations against high-ranking Chinese officials sometimes while working out when did you buy this apartment uh 2015 yeah and you paid 68 million dollars no 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 this is the all the fake numbers i like it mr donald trump yeah. president talk the fake news this yeah. is the this is the idea really good i have since about me is fake even the apartment the price is fake Yeah. I buy the apartment totally pay 82 million. There are a lot of disputed facts about Guo. Everything from when he was born to where he was born. What is known about his Gatsby-like existence is he became close to high-ranking Chinese officials in the 1990s and became super rich through real estate developments. But by 2015, Guo fled to the United States. Just as a government ally he was linked to came under investigation for accepting bribes. Okay, that's a different view. Wow. Oh. So Chinese still love this the corner. This Chinese yeah. called Diamond Corner. Yeah. 59 and uh, this Fifth Avenue. This is the South East. Yeah. Kind of called Feng Shui Corner. Yeah. Only New York super hotel, shopping, super restaurant, super office and the Central Park. <laughs> they they did a very very bad job yeah. teaching you communism. The Chinese government accuses Guo of bribery, fraud, and money laundering. Guo Wenhui is a foreign terrorist organization that has issued a warrant for his arrest. China has issued a warrant for his arrest, but it doesn't have an extradition treaty with the U.S. Guo has turned around and used YouTube and Twitter to level the exact same corruption charges against top members of China's Communist Party. He accuses the government of being a mafia and says he's fighting for China to stamp out corruption. This American agree American this big valuable but sometime American forgot this going to think money is think big house no yeah. your freedom your security this is number one important this is the 21st uh, century we need a root by law root of the law not root by mafia so one man in an 82 million dollar apartment with a youtube stream can change china <laughs> yeah definitely really we show you <laughs> Guo live streams every day, sometimes for hours, exposing or threatening to reveal secret business deals and financial collusion. Okay, 
<laughs> Just my job now. It's your job now. Yeah. You're, a, you're a TV star now. Yeah. No, I don't like it. How'd it go? Star. Go okay? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Really good. Guo says it's his live streams and tweets that toppled Meng Qianzhu, the former head of law enforcement, and Wang Qishan, China's anti-corruption czar. Guo called them his top enemies. Neither were investigated or charged with anything. But last month, both retired from Chinese leadership. Not long ago, you said fairly recently that China's hacking power mm -hmm. could have an effect in this country worse than 9-11. Yes. Right? Yes. This phone, this one, I want to show you. Just yesterday, we sent back. I forgot. You don't know which one it is. This one, just this phone. I take the phone, go, go on to my, my yacht, my yacht lose control. So you think they took over the controls of your yacht? Control the phone. Through the phone. Uh, control through the phone. Control my yacht. Really? Yes. You, Seriously, you, they you, can you, do that? You, yeah. You. This I will tell you. This is dangerous. Hmm. You need. Guo's Twitter and Facebook accounts are also routinely blocked. At a recent Senate hearing, Facebook lawyers insisted it was because Guo published other people's personal information. You did not come under pressure from the Chinese government or any of its representatives or people working for them to block his account or to block whatever it is you blocked. We did receive an, a report from representatives of the Chinese government about the account. We analyzed that report as we would any other. Several members of Guo's family have been arrested. His brother and niece were sent to prison a few weeks ago for destroying accounting documents connected to the family's fortune. Why do you think the government's so afraid of you? You know, the Chinese government accuses you of doing things like, you know, playing dirty, releasing people's information, and, you know, releasing sex tapes and things like this. You accuse the government of doing the same thing to you. Do you regret any of those tactics that in any of the, the way that you fought this, this campaign? Right? You I know what I'm saying? Know. I love you now. Come on, it's a, it's a fair Last question. Last night, my wife asked the same question. <laughs> she did? She asked the same question? Yeah. Did she, did she say, ah, you gotta yeah. stop doing it this way? Yeah, yeah, you yeah, see, yeah. You're, you're, you're being too hard. Yeah, you're yeah. being too tough. Yeah, you regret? You think we have another situation maybe better? This is a very emotional question. Because uh Wazaiangu 我真想改变中国，我要去做这个事情。Guo is appealing to the United States for asylum, and has made friends with people connected to the Trump administration, including Steve Bannon. In the meantime, his sanctuary is an apartment that real estate records show was purchased not for eighty-two million dollars, but for sixty-seven point five. Alabama Senate candidate Roy Moore's campaign staged a late-day press conference today to challenge allegations that Moore forced himself on two teenage women and tried to initiate relationships with several others when he was a prosecutor in his 30s. Not one time have I ever seen him act even remotely inappropriate against any woman. As part of his argument, Moore's attorney demanded that one of his accusers turn over a yearbook she claims Moore signed. But shortly afterward, another accuser came forward, saying that Moore groped her in his law office in 1991, when she was 28. The back and forth allegations guarantee that the story will be a national obsession for yet another day. 
But in Moore's home state of Alabama, not everyone is so rattled by the charges. Inside the Beltway and across most of America, the allegations against Roy Moore seem obviously and viscerally wrong. If those allegations are true, they should disqualify him from ever serving in public office again. But there's still a chance Roy Moore could be the next senator from Alabama. Because some folks here see those allegations a little bit differently. So I went to a senior center in Huntsville to talk to an older generation about how they view all this. I heard from a lot of folks there that back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, it wasn't that uncommon for older men to court younger women. I spoke with two friends, Marjorie, a retired secretary, and Margaret, a retired teacher. They agreed on one thing. The stuff those women accused Roy Moore of doing was pretty typical of men when they were growing up. But despite that, they still disagreed on the race. Marjorie's supporting Roy Moore, and Margaret's supporting Doug Jones. What do you think about what's going on with Roy Moore right now? I think it's terrible, especially coming from Alabama. So we don't need that kind of thing happening here. Why do you think Alabama's got a bit of a reputation? Is that what you're worried about? Well, uh, uh, I think it does have with other states. Uh, we're lower in education. But I don't like bad news coming out of Alabama about anything since I live here. I want it to be a good place. Was that kind of thing, sort of older men dating younger women, a little bit more common, do you think, back then? Or less, less of a big deal? Well, we just didn't hear about it. What do you mean? You think it happened, but you didn't hear about it? Yes, I do think it happened. Well, things that happened to women back then, they didn't tell it because yes. they wouldn't have been believed. Mm. And it's so hard to come out and tell something like that on you. So you think there is a world in which these women would have kept quiet for so long because it was common and it just... I do, I do. Wow. Do you know any folks that personally experienced something like that? Well, even when I was in school, uh, things happened, but, uh, you know, me and teachers touched us, maybe inappropriately, but we just didn't say anything. We just, you know, thought we had that was part of life. Why was that? Why do you think people didn't realize that it was inappropriate back then? I don't know. I guess the, the women, you know, the underdog or whatever, we always had to do what the men said. <laughs> Why continue to support Roy Moore if, you know, what happened back then you think might have been inappropriate? I still say they haven't proven it. At 159.4 million dollars, Pablo Picasso's La Femme d'Alger holds the record for the most expensive work of art ever sold at auction. But Wednesday night in New York City, a recently rediscovered painting by Leonardo da Vinci could top it. Salvatore Mundi is a 500-year-old portrait of Christ, formerly owned by a Russian oligarch. It's valued at 100 million dollars. But a chance to own the only da Vinci painting outside of a museum could drive bidding oh. past $200 million. We went to Christie's with Brazilian artist Vic Muniz, who's famous for his recreations of classic works, for a private viewing of Salvatore Mundi to see what $100 million worth of genius really looks like. Wow. The fact that uh, the painting is being out of public view for so long, you have an urge to see it because God knows, you know, if this painting goes to a private collector, it won't be seen for a long, long time. Looking at that painting, it's, it's just a first look immediately tells me it's a Leonardo. Nobody could paint hair like that. Only he could paint a, a crystal ball without its, in, its inner imperfections. There's something about the folds, you know, the way he depicted drapery is, is particularly similar to a lot of uh, the drapery present in most of his works. This is a depiction of Christ. Most paintings depicting like saints or, or divinity, 
they rely on having a halo. And here, no, no, he just decides to picture Christ as a man. There's a, an utter physicality to it. Da Vinci painted in layers of glazes. So the picture has this amazing depth and inspires you to think about a person. It feels like an apparition, you know. It's there and it isn't, almost like a ghost. And the way he was so discerning about painting, it left him with little choice but abandoning many of his paintings. You know, he, he didn't finish most of the work he started. It's rare to see a finishing painting by Leonardo da Vinci. As I said, there's like over a dozen of them. And this is one of it. Leonardo, you know, he probably influenced every artist since his death. And I think he uh, cemented the idea of the artist as an observer, as somebody who's translating the world. Art has always been about negotiating what's inside our heads, what's around us. And Leonardo did that with such mastery. The fact that it, an important work of art has value. It guarantees uh, its continuation into the history it's supposed to depict. A hundred million dollars is such a number. You know, I, don't, I cannot think of it. But I'm sure it's not so much of a number for some people. That's Vice News Tonight for Wednesday, November 15th. 